Uh, thanks, Terry. Thanks for the invitation to talk. I've enjoyed the meeting. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about um, our concurrent masters in genomic medicine for medical students. And this is a program where they can get an MS and an MD in the same four years. Um, so we all know the uh, genomic information is to be incorporated. And um, about 12 years ago or so, we started uh, with DOD funding uh, a me genomic medicine a project in Guilford County that's uh, now known as, I think, is the Geomedical Connection. And that purpose was to really model more than practice at that time. And we went in thinking that we were going to have to do all this education of the public, and we were worried about all the ethical things that we all worry about. And we found out that it, the public was not the problem. Once they figured out it was prevention, they really were not as worried, and you explain things to them. Uh, they were not the problem. It was the physician that was clearly the problem. And the physicians in private, and this was in private practice, which is where, of course, most physicians lie um, in the United States, uh, were just reluctant to practice genomics. We had individuals who told us they wouldn't even take a family history because they were afraid of what they would find. And it ca uh, came to us that the physicians are the actual consumers. They're the gatekeepers to the patients, as as we've talked about with, with the ACMG. And without creating a market for what we're uh, generating and the data we're, we're providing, if we don't have a market, we're going to have, you know, we could have a, like a genetically modified food problem where you have uh, many things that are, are quite appropriate, but because they have the name individuals, uh, don't follow it, and here the problem was that they came and presented all the information in the product before they had the market set up. So we found that one of the major bottlenecks is the lack of knowledge and comfort by physicians, and older physicians never were taught genetics, um, so that's a big problem. And for younger phys uh, uh, physicians and, and current medical students, the, the curriculum's already full and they have to learn so much for their boards. And uh, so if you were to put more genetics in, you have to yank things out. And this lack of training increases the concern for litigation. Um, I was surprised, uh, having uh, practiced all my time in academia, uh, about the amount of concern of litigation in the private sector. Maybe I shouldn't have, but uh, in academia, I think we're all experts. This is not the case there. And they actually go to websites and follow flow, flow uh, charts and patterns. So this is a huge problem. If you don't understand what you're doing, you're even more or less likely to, to use it. And the time to catch up, is, as was mentioned previously, is a real problem. They already have enough to know uh, in their own specialty. And with all the economics, uh, this is just dissuades people. So we decided to do something that uh, we could actually control, and that was create a master's program. But a master's program, uh, not with a year off, but a master's program that you get the master's during the same four years uh, of medical school. And there are a lot of advantages to this. Uh, it avoids the curriculum problem if we run it concor concordantly with the MD. We can train, you know, the old adage and we all know in medicine is, uh, uh, see one, do one, teach one, well, we can train one individual medical student and they can start to train others. It increases awareness in other medical students as they're going along in, um, in medical school. And the goal here is not to create a medical geneticist, but it's to create a qualified consumer and advocate. That's really what we're looking for, is to create a market. And increases the value, we believe, for the residency for the students. And as I said, some medical schools uh, uh, take an added year for masters, and, and uh, certainly that's when I was a medical student, no one did that, but now that's about 15% of my daughter's uh, medical school class. Uh, it, it took an extra year or so, but that is not the way we decided to go. And incorporating over four regular years uh, gives a lot more time for a masters, which is usually two years, one or two years gives time for questions, reinforces the training, we hope. It also means they keep up to date into the residency, so they're still in the program when they actually graduate and move on to their residency. 
And for us, it creates a much less uh, intense uh, infrastructure that we have to build because we don't have to take care of people for an entire year and that's all they're doing, but we now can add on and it's, it's less uh, intense in terms of money and set up for us. So it's a 30 credit uh, hour program over four years and we do all the didactic courseware online. And um, this was one of the first questions is how do we do this? And um, one night I was watching my daughter uh, who's at UM, uh, University of Miami Medical School. And uh, it was midnight and she was in her pajamas and she was listening to her lectures on the video um, because they only go to class anymore really for social reasons. And um, you know, it made a lot of sense. She could move it back and forth. Guy had an accent, it was hard to understand. You could write, take notes. So I said, well, we could do this too. So we do all our didactic uh, discussions and coursework is, is online. And uh, they can do this anytime during the week. And then we have small group discussions once a week, um, which students really like. And uh, there we discuss either what we've on the online material or we go over papers or clinically oriented things. Uh, they'll have a laboratory rotation between their first and second year of about a month, where it's mainly in the clinical labs, get an idea of, of what's going on. They have one clinical rotation I at least in their um, last, uh, usually in the fourth year. And then they're going to do a, a, a thesis um, in genomics of some type, obviously a literature thesis. So now in the training uh, workshop a couple, uh, a month ago or so, it was pointed out that to do this you need a lot of support uh, genetics is clearly a um, multidisciplinary uh, function, and so we do have a lot. We're lucky that we have a lot of faculty that are involved in this process, um, as well as graduate students uh, for the medical students to interact with. So this is the curriculum. I don't know if you can see it in this room, but the first the first uh, year we have. Uh, uh, a teaching of fundamentals of genomic medicine. This is basic genetics. I taught this, uh, this whoops, I taught this uh, s semester the clinical applications, which we did about half um, didactics and then small groups, and then um, uh, we did a lot of papers related to uh, genomic medicine and, and concepts based on that. Uh, they've gone through some uh, ethics with Susan Hahn, who's going to be the new uh, president of the genetic counselors. And uh, they'll do a laboratory because uh, they have some free time between those two for first and second year. Computational methods in year two, clinical applications. Again, ethics and pharmacogenetics. And then they'll do a clerkship and their practum, practicum, which is the thesis-like. And we've decided already that we need to add some small group sessions. Uh, we'll have to figure out how to do it exactly, probably make it so they attend one in every two or three weeks. We'll have running ones because it's, it, this is really an important time to interact. So we uh, started our first class in the spring semester this year. Uh, we didn't advertise except internally. The medical school wanted us to let the medical students do uh, gross anatomy first. They didn't want to tax them. Uh, we had 10 students applied in November from 150. Nine were approved. There was one that was not doing quite well enough so that medical school felt that that was not, they were not going to be able to do both. We have five students in the first class uh, and four decided not to move on. Three uh, was due to money and of course that's one of the problems as a parent of a medical student when someone comes to me and says, well, it's going to be another $40,000, um, you know, I'm going to say, huh? But I have to say, today's medical students, it's incredible <laughs> the, the loans they're supporting. I would say $200,000 is not an abnormal number or $250,000, unfortunately. Now, these are not uh, people who are interested in going into genetics, the neurosurgery, oncology, pediatrics, cardiology, internal medicine. So 
Uh, these are their current interests. I'm sure they'll change some, but um, this is not their goal. Here's a picture of our first students, uh, five, and the, why did they enter into the program? Well, they, they came to realize, that, they all came to realize that genetics is in all aspects of medicine. We went through several aspects, even papers were surgery and genomic medicine, and they, they, they said, and one of them said, geez, even in surgery, genetics is important. They all have a personal interest in genomics. Some of the interesting things is they've already noted usefulness in understanding some of their lectures, which uh, do, of course, have genetics in it. The one I really enjoy is uh, they, they love coming to me and telling me about how their professors are making mistakes in their lectures on genetics. So they're already getting uh, some background and training, and they're also, I think, uh, taking some ownership. And I'm happy to say that two of the students on their own uh, sought out and received funding for the diversity conference on genomics this week, and they're taking time out, and they'll have to make it up. So they're, they're really uh, have gotten interested. And it's my plug for the meeting this week, which several of you, I think, are uh, attending a conference to eliminate health disparities in genomic medicine. This is our second year. We're doing it with uh, Stanford. Whoops, and uh, Carlos Bustamani is, is the other co-host. And this year, we're focusing on industry's uh, role in creating diversity in genomics. So what are some of the problems of doing this? Well, uh, the added cost is clearly a problem uh, for reasons that are somewhat bizarre. Um, the out-of-state students at University of Miami, it's free. The program's free. It's only the students in Florida that are punished. Um, but, you know, we're in Florida, so. Uh, <laughs> and uh, not all students can handle both programs. You do have to remain flexible in scheduling. Um, the medical school decided to change the, uh, cur uh, the curriculum and the, the scheduling for physical diagnosis in the first year, so we had to change our curriculum. And it is added time for the students. But, and they, they've complained a little bit. Um, because all medical students complain, but they're all doing very well, so, in medical school. And that's the first thing, of course, we want them to do well in medical school, so we don't want to uh, interfere. So funding, the Hayward Foundation, which funds mainly in Florida, had funded the initial cost of setting up some of the videos, uh, helping fund the, um, the faculty. Um, at 30, we, we calculate that about 32 to 35 students, it should be self-supporting, so that's an important point. Uh, we shouldn't have to be funding this every, all the time. But we do need support for the program and students, and we'll be looking for that. And we're advertising now for our first class uh, outside, so for the class coming in. We've had many inquiries. There's a lot of interest in this in uh, potential medical students. So uh, we're excited about this, and we think it's um, going to be a real a positive thing. And uh, I should just say that Bill Scott uh, has been real helpful, uh, and uh, Susan Blanton, and Kayla is the genetic counselor involved, and of course my wife, uh, Dr. Perichek Vance, has been involved as well. So I'll stop there, take any questions. So I'm wondering if uh, underlying this, you also have a uh, uh, research agenda to really uh, be able to follow these folks along and see what is the uh, short, medium, and long-term impact of this type of a program in terms of creating uh, that informed consumer that sure. you're uh, targeting. Uh, we haven't really, I mean, we're, that's in the plans. I think we'll, we'll be doing that. We've been sort of totally focused on getting up and running and, you know, a little bit um, as Larry said, you, sometimes you have to make changes on the flight, but um, uh, but I think that's very important, uh, uh, documenting that we're actually doing something. Yeah. Other comments? Yes, Bruce. Uh, for those that are paying for this, what do you tell them about their how this is going to enhance their career? I mean, what's the investment return that you can yeah. offer to them? Well. <laughs> We haven't had to really sell them, I, I, I would say. Most of them realize genetics is so is important, uh, and uh, I think they see value in being the first ones early on. They all see value in their residency because they feel that this will be an added plus in their residency. Um, 
you know, there are some, some of these residencies now are so difficult to get into. So um, I think there's added value there for sure. Um, it really hasn't, you know, but we're not looking for everyone, you know. So if we can take 10 students a year right now, that would be great. I think that's a good number. That's what we could handle. We had actually budgeted for five, so the first year because we were just internally mm -hmm. advertising. But yeah, I think that's always true. But they're spending a lot of money on medical school, so they 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 know what's coming. Jeff, could I just just ask? You said you're you're videotaping or recording all of your your lectures. Is there some way to make those widely available? I know I asked you this in April too. Is there some way to make those available to other groups that might want to share those, either with medical students or practitioners? Yeah, uh, I I don't know that they're kind of being done on the fly. You know, they're being done a little bit. I don't know how. Perf they're, they're, we have a so right now we, we're using a pen op. I think that's right. So I can I voice over. I chose not to make a talking head kind of thing, and most of us are doing that way. But yeah, we could certainly share with people who are interested. Um, I know that at the other meeting, and I think it's true that this could be a packaged situation for places that don't have the depth of knowledge, but certainly that's it. And we, we hope to start a program for residents, or I think fellows would probably work even better than residents because of the time factor. But um, there's a lot of interest in, in from residents, uh, particularly primary care. It, it, in our in our place, the, the family uh, me, um, family medicine folks almost all have t an extra two years of some specialty they're doing, you know, geriatrics or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, there's a this is a really I, I think this is a great program, and I'm really glad to hear that you're talking about uh, ideas relating to residency and fellowship. And and I think even in the postgraduate space, I mean, one area that has um, done something similar to this is uh, informatics, medical informatics, where you can go and you can get do a one or two year uh, program uh, and um, you know get a certificate or master's or something of that nature. And many of them involve actually doing um, uh, hands-on projects. So I think that's a really good model. So you don't, you know, you're, you're not a full-fledged uh, uh, dyed-in-the-wool informaticist that can write code and yeah. all that sort of stuff, but you understand the principles that are needed to be able to do the implementation sorts of things that we're talking about. Right. That's the goal, is, is create the consumer, in, in a sense. Well, and I guess just to follow up, I, I would encourage you, even if it's not a perfectly packaged program in that, people watch a lot of stuff on the web and there's a lot of interest in watching these kinds of things. Um, and, and there might be some simple way, I mean, we have, I think, I think we've talked about through um, our, our education branch, um, or maybe it's the genomic medicine branch in, in Laura's group, um, the, the possibility of storing some of these uh, uh, kinds of materials, and I, I think we'd be happy to do that. So, yeah. Yes. One really easy way is to just podcast the darn thing. I mean, I, I, re, I listen to podcasts from MIT, from Stanford, from all over the place. You know, as you're going on the metro and you're bored out of your skull trying to get to work, at least you listen to a half hour lecture and keep up with some stuff. Yeah, now most of these have slides uh, hooked with them. But podcasts, I guess that nowadays that's hook, not a, that's that not a be, problem, I but guess. But that may be the exact hook that you use if you want to get people in you want to get the full course, this is what you need to do. But here's what happens when you're, you just listen to it. You learn enough. You can get any, anybody out there. You can get yourself the primary care uh, practitioner learning about this, and as genomics grows, they don't feel outcast as well. They, they actually become a part of it. Yeah, they we're, come to you as a source. Yeah, so we're, we're going to try to incorporate some of this and some of the stuff we're doing with neurology. Neurology, one of the things we're talking about doing is uh, the big problem there is for existing is everyone wants uh, genetics for dummies because they they don't even they're so uh, angst about it. So we're thinking about having an online genetic for dummies that you have to take, and then you can take. Uh, neurology has a huge education system in their their meetings, and then you can take, say. Genetics for MS. Seems like every neurologist does MS. Uh, so, because uh, they don't want to know, they, if, they, if they do MS, they don't want to know about dementia. They don't want to know about neuropathies. They want to know about MS. So you, you give them the stuff they need to know to understand what's going on in their subspecialty of their subspecialty, because that's really what they want. Um, so, but I think the podcast is a great idea. 
Yeah. I had one question, Terry. Over here. <laughs> it's Jeannie. <laughs> Where am I? Um, just interdisciplinary. Within your school, do you have other healthcare providers that could benefit from all this work that you're doing? Um, yeah, we have a nursing school, so we, we're, we've had some interest from there. Uh, we don't have a pharmacy school, but there's one at Nova close by. Um, obviously, third-party payers, we've had some interest. We've had some interest even from uh, uh, sequencing, you know, technical companies who have individuals who are going out in the field who don't really know them a whole lot. It's physician assistants, do you have those? Uh, we don't have many of physician assistants. That's uh, Je Jeff... Uh, Duke, we had nothing but physician's assistants when I was there, but yeah, it's not a whole lot of them down there. Nurse practitioners, South Florida is real big, so nurse practitioners would be another one. Well, um, one of the interesting things, you know, in terms of looking at the overall educational environment is that, you know, NichePig has had pretty success, pretty good success engaging with the uh, these types of ancillary providers. They have a robust physician's assistance course, advanced practice nurses, audiologists, you know, the the group that they've had a problem engaging has been the physician group, much as you were starting out with. So in some sense, you know, rather than, you know, reinventing, this is, I think, is an opportunity to be able to connect uh, with the successes that they've had and create that broader yeah. portfolio. No, I, I think that's true. You know, our focus here was just to get up and going and see if it would work, and it looks like it's going to work fine and, 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 in fact, better than we thought. So... I think that's absolutely right. There's a lot of places to go. And I do think education is, we, we shouldn't forget about education here as we move ahead with this, you know, your, this group because we, we do have to create the market. It's just, you know, when we think business, we have to, it's a business, money runs everything, so. Great. I think Liz may have had one uh, last question. Liz, did you have a comment to make? Yeah, I was just thinking, you know, there are places like Coursera and stuff where you can take Stanford classes and things like that. I mean, that, and that's that's at your own leisure. It seems like if you had a, a filmed curriculum or whatever it was, it would be pretty easy to do that way. And I think you can even get credit for some of these courses. Yeah, I, I think for physicians, CME credit would be the thing to draw for them. Yeah, yeah which they would have to then be hooked to some sort of... Um, facility that gives CME, but uh, I think that that would be for existing physicians, yeah. Great. Okay. I think we ought to, ought to finish up. Thank you very much, Jeff. That's terrific. Super. Next, we'll, we'll hear about something a, a little bit different, um, and that's uh, Dan Roden talking about um, uh, a number of programs through the Pharmacogenomics Research Network related to genomic medicine implementation. So